Did Genesis chapters 1 through 3 borrow elements from much earlier Mesopotamian mythological stories? Brace yourself as we explore the linguistic, lexical, and thematic connections between these ancient myths, such as the Enuma Elish and the Genesis narrative. But let's not overlook the implications of such borrowing. Shouldn't this compel open-minded individuals to question the literal truth of these stories? Before we proceed, let's address some crucial points. The Hebrew language, as recorded in the earliest texts, dates back perhaps to the 10th century BCE, while the Mesopotamian myths etched onto clay tablets are often over 1,000 years older. Contrary to mistaken assumptions, the Hebrew Bible's creation and flood story contains Akkadian cognates from that much earlier language, not the other way around. It is essential to clarify this misconception and correct any misguided notions that suggest the other myths drew inspiration from the Bible. This factual inaccuracy needs to be rectified before we continue. Those who attempt to use Mesopotamian myths as evidence supporting the historical truth of the biblical narrative are quite frankly missing the boat, or rather missing Noah's Ark altogether. Can we genuinely believe that Utnapishtim and his wife are walking among us? bestowed with immortality by the gods? Do we truly entertain the notion that Enlil annihilated humanity simply for being too noisy? Or that Marduk fashioned the cosmos from the remains of the sea goddess Tiamat? It's a resounding no to both, of course. As someone who was a Bible fundamentalist, I understand the profound impact of blindly following ill-informed teachings. Today, reading these older texts and understanding their original context has given me a richer understanding of the meaning of these stories. I actually love these stories for what they are, and it is my goal for others to enjoy reading them in their actual historical context, and not as if they dropped out of heaven. However, as we explore the intricate web of connections between these polytheistic Mesopotamian myths and the later monotheistic Hebrew Bible, it becomes evident that the Genesis creation and flood accounts were crafted using popular mythological motifs of the time. This realization raises critical questions about the historical plausibility and the nature of scriptural inspiration. Yes, the Bible is undoubtedly inspired, but by these pre-existing Mesopotamian myths that served as a foundation for its storytelling. Join us on this intellectual journey, my friends. Scholars agree that most of the primeval history borrows directly or indirectly from Mesopotamian mythology, and Genesis 1 is no exception. While there is debate as to whether such borrowing was conscious and polemical, or simply due to the overall influence of the myth in the ancient Near East, the consensus is that the opening chapter of Genesis almost certainly owes its existence to the Enuma Elish. 
The Enuma Elish is an Akkadian story dating back to the mid to late 2nd millennium BCE that tells of the god Marduk and his rise to power over the other gods. The story begins before heaven and earth had been created. The two water deities, Apsu and Tiamat, brought forth the gods. Shortly after their creation, however, they became noisy and bothersome to the god, Apsu, who decided to kill them. Ea, however, in his wisdom, was able to thwart Apsu's plans and fought back. Ea was aware of all, discerned their stratagem. He fashioned it. He established it. A master plan. He made it artful, his superb magic spell. He recited it and brought him to rest in the waters. He put him in deep slumber. He was fast asleep. He made Apsu sleep. He tied up Apsu. He killed him. Having killed Apsu, Ea and his spouse Damkina take over his home and give birth to mighty Marduk. His body was magnificent, fiery his glance. He was a hero at birth. He was a mighty one from the beginning. Anu creates four winds for Marduk to play with, and with them he disturbed Tiamat. He caused a wave and it roiled Tiamat. Tiamat was roiled, churning day and night, the gods finding no rest for the brunt of each wind. Tiamat plots to kill Marduk and the other gods. Mother Hubor, Tiamat, who can form everything, added countless invincible weapons gave birth to monster serpents pointed of fang. With merciless incisors, she filled their bodies with venom for blood. Fierce dragons she clad with glories, causing them to bear auras like gods, saying, whoever sees them shall collapse from weakness. Wherever their bodies make onslaught, they shall not turn back. Her commands were absolute. No one opposed them. Eleven, indeed, on this wise, she created. Her husband, Kingu, she promoted to the highest position, giving him the famous Tablet of Destinies. She proclaimed, I cast your spell. I make you the greatest in the assembly of the gods. Kingship of all the gods I put in your power. You are the greatest in the assembly of the gods kingship of all the gods I put in your power. The great god Anshar called upon Ea to go fight Tiamat, but his response was shocking. Ea went to seek out Tiamat's stratagem. He stopped horror-stricken, then turned back. He came before Anshar the sovereign. He beseeched him with entreaties, saying, My father, Tiamat has carried her actions beyond me. I sought out her course, but my spell cannot counter it. Her strength is enormous. She is utterly terrifying. She is reinforced with a host. None can go out against her. Her challenge was not reduced. It was so loud against me, I became afraid at her clamor. I turned back. My father, do not despair. Send another to her. Anshar then went to Anu, another senior god who gave the same response. It was only then that Marduk volunteered to take Tiamat down. Marduk then charges to battle, defeats Kingu simply by approaching, and ultimately kills the sea goddess, creating the world from her carcass. There are several possible points of contact between these two myths. Let's begin with the very first line of the book of Genesis. Along with John 3.16, many of us can probably at least start Genesis 
In the beginning, God created. This familiar English translation has led to some interpreters suggesting that the first sentence in the Bible is of existential proof. In the beginning was God. However, the intended meaning of this first clause is not quite so simply construed as King James had commissioned. The Hebrew phrase that starts off the verse can be translated at least two, if not three, different ways, and the translation is significant for reading the rest of the story. Professor David M. Carr notes of this passage. One of the first and most important interpretive and translation issues in this chapter is the question of whether Genesis 1-1 is a dependent clause introducing what follows, when God created, or an independent clause, in the beginning, God created. While there are other interpretive issues involved here, like should this be considered creation from nothing? Our only concern on this point is Genesis 1-1's potential similarity to Enuma Elish. This story opens. When the heavens above did not exist, and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. Notice how the first line is part of a dependent clause. That is a clause that cannot stand alone in the sentence and is dependent on another clause. This is otherwise known as a temporal clause, describing a period before creation. If Genesis 1-1 should be translated, When God began to create, or something similar, then this should describe a situation before God began to create. The arguments are somewhat complex, and we need not go into them here. For example, Professor Robert D. Homestead wrote an article in 2008 dedicated entirely to the grammatical and syntactical features of this first phrase in Genesis 1-1 to determine whether the verse should be translated as a dependent or independent clause. Basically, there are several occurrences of this phrase in the Hebrew Bible, and they are usually translated with the word of attached to them. In the beginning of the reign of so-and-so king. This would mean that Genesis 1-1 would be translated something like, In the beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth. Or more smoothly, when God began to create the heavens and the earth. When we continue the passage in Genesis 1, if understood in this way, the text is explaining. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was... In other words, this was the state of the world when God began to create. When we compare this to other Mesopotamian creation stories, and Enuma Elish in particular, we see something similar. Professor Joseph Blankensop writes, Genesis 1 belongs to the genre of cosmogony, narratives about world origins, and ancient cosmogonic myths in that culture area begin by describing the way it was at the time of the first creation only then proceeding to the creation itself. This is not only true of other ancient Near Eastern cosmogonic myths, but also in at least one other place in the Hebrew Bible, in Genesis 2. The second creation story begins by describing the state of the earth before God begins his creative act. Carr writes, the creation account that follows Genesis 1 in the Bible and likely predated it, Genesis 2, 5 to 3, 24, likewise begins with a description of the uncreated prologue to God's creation. Genesis 1 similarly begins with a statement of what creation was like before God created. It seems as though this narrative pattern of describing the pre-creation state of affairs 
is common not only to ancient Near Eastern compositions, but also to the Old Testament. It appears that Genesis 1 is also following this pattern, perhaps modeled after the opening line of Enuma Elish. This possibility is strengthened by the presence of the Hebrew word to home, the deep, that is found in Genesis 1-2. Professor Ludwig Kohler and Walter Baumgartner explain that the word to home likely is derived from the general Semitic, Tiham, C. So as such, it is not a loanword from Akkadian. Both Akkadian, the language of the Enuma Elish, and Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, are Semitic languages. And the word Tahom, Hebrew, and Tiamat, the name of the Akkadian sea goddess in Enuma Elish, go back to the Semitic word Taham. In other words, this appears to be a case in which both the Hebrew and Akkadian are drawing on a similar source, but one may not be directly drawing from the other. This is an important point as we want to be precise when attempting to see connections and dependence between texts. As we noted in a previous section, one of the ways that we determine borrowing is the presence of shared language between the two texts. The more unique the language that is shared, the greater the possibility of borrowing. In this instance, one might be tempted to see a direct borrowing of Tiamat, the Akkadian sea goddess, in the word to home. But this is not necessarily the case. Both words are clearly cognates, but we may not be able to say more than that from a strictly lexical standpoint. Blankensop agrees. The Tehom may be related to the same Semitic root as the proto-goddess Tiamat, representing the chaotic salt waters of the ocean from whose body the earth was formed. What is noteworthy, however, is its place in the text. To reiterate the opening lines in Enuma Elish are, When the heavens above did not exist, and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. Notice that following dependent temporal clauses, we see the figure Tiamat appearing in the first few lines right at the beginning of the text. In Genesis 1, we read, When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the deep. To home. As in Enuma Elish, the cognate word for sea shows up in the opening lines following a dependent temporal clause. There is more to suggest that the Tahom is meant to be connected to one degree or another to the sea goddess Tiamat of Enuma Elish. The word shows up in many other passages in the Hebrew Bible, many of which use the term to describe a mighty, awe-inspiring, and completely out-of-reach place. However, it does appear to have a more nuanced meaning in certain texts, particularly in some of the Psalms. In Psalm 77, it appears that Yahweh is doing some sort of battle with a personified form of the deep. In Psalm 77, 17, we read, the waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and trembled. Indeed, the depths, Tehomot, quaked. This psalm zeroes in on the Exodus event, but the description of the waters here has a clearly primordial nuance. Professor Frank Lothar Hosfeld explains. The cosmological insertion holds a unique place within the whole of the psalm. It is true that the emphasis on the element of water has an obvious association with the passage through the sea, 
the Exodus. But here it is a matter of the mythical cosmic confrontation between the superior God King and the waters of chaos. Concerning verse 17 specifically, he writes, In verse 17, the subterranean primeval waters are in terror before the God manifested in Theophany. Here the primeval waters are the direct opponents. It would seem that the Tahom is personified in the text as an enemy of God that needs to be conquered. Similar but not identical language can be seen in Psalm 104, a hymn that praises Yahweh for his power in and over his creation. In verses 6 through 7, we read, You covered it, the earth, with the deep, to home, like a garment. The water stood over the mountains. They fled from your threat. From the sound of your thunder, they hurried away. There is clear poetic imagery here that personifies the deep. It flees and hurries away from the power expressed by Yahweh. However, there is a move away from depicting Tahom directly as an enemy combatant, as seen in other passages. This, in fact, appears to be the same nuance that appears in Genesis 1 verse 2. Notice what Professor Daniel Estes says about this. In any thought, the waters represented the forces of chaos, but throughout the Old Testament, they are under the control of the Lord. Let's sum up and tie this back to Genesis 1-2 and to home. First, passages like Psalm 77 and 104 clearly describe Yahweh working against the primordial cosmic forces to bring about creation or show forth his unmatched power. Professor Othmar Kill and Sylvia Schroer discuss various passages featuring the chaotic waters in these creative contexts and conclude, Traces of the motif of the battle against chaos can be found in many Old Testament passages. The use of traces here is at times more appropriate than others. There are certainly passages that depict the battles with the forces of chaos against Yahweh in clear, straightforward language. However, in Psalm 104 and Genesis 1, I think we are seeing only traces of the divine battle with the sea. In other words, instead of an overt description, the author of Genesis 1 seems to have gone to some lengths to downplay the significance of the power of the primordial sea. Blankensop says it this way, The author of Genesis 1, a learned priest and scribe familiar with Mesopotamian and Levantine myths of origins, has so thoroughly demythologized the different narrative elements of the creation story. For example, by substituting the to home for Tiamat, and by eliminating the use of physical material in creation, mud, blood, etc., that we have to work hard to detect the mythological Ereafon background of his account. Although the priestly writer has constructed the creation story to downplay the mythological aspects of the battle with chaos, and therefore rendering the primary opponent powerless before Yahweh, we can still see remnants of the narrative components still present in the texts. There are obviously more points of contact between the Enuma Elish and the story in Genesis 1. Carr notes several, including the connection between Tiamat's carcass being used to create the dome over the world in Enuma Elish, and the formation of the vault of heaven in Genesis 1 from the waters. He also draws attention to heavenly signs from both Enuma Elish and Genesis 1, as well as the great sea monsters. These two may function as blind motifs. 
What is more important here, however, is the fact that Genesis 1 is dependent upon the Enuma Elish and potentially other ancient Near Eastern myths that incorporate the battle with primordial chaos. These myths clearly predate the biblical text, and the parallels between them and Genesis 1 are arguably too numerous and contextually effective to be mere coincidence. If someone begins to read the Old Testament for the first time, it probably won't take them long to realize that Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4 sounds quite different from Genesis 2, 4 to 25. If they are paying close attention to the story, chapter 2 seems to tell the story of creation for a second time. John J. Collins writes, Whatever the origin of the Adam and Eve story, it stands in sharp contrast to the priestly account of creation that now forms the opening chapter of the Bible. Not only does the sequence of events differ from the first account to the second, but the writing style is quite distinct. In this section, however, we will only focus on the order of events and how they are distinct from and contradictory to one another. Let's begin with Genesis 1. If we go through the chapter, we see the following order of creative events. Day 1. Light. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God divided between the light and the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. Genesis 1. 3 to 5. Day 2. The Vault. Sky. And God made the vault, and he divided between the waters that are under the vault and the waters that are above the vault. And it was so. Genesis 1 7. Day 3. Dry land, seas, and vegetation. And God said, Let the waters be gathered together under the heavens to one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the accumulation of waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good, and God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants producing seed, fruit trees producing fruit according to its species, whose seed is in it upon the earth. And it was so. Genesis 1, 9 through 11. Day 4, Sun, Moon, and Stars. And God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day, and the small light to rule the night, and the stars. Genesis 1, 16. Day 5, Sea Creatures and Birds. And God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly over the earth, over the surface of the vault of the heavens. Genesis 1, 20. Day 6, Land Creatures and Mankind And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their species, beasts and creeping animals, and animals of the earth according to their kind. And it was so. And God said, Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, and the beasts and all the earth and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth. And God created humanity in his image. In the likeness of God he created them. Male and female he created them. Genesis 1, 24, 26-27 The narrative in Genesis 2 is not as literarily structured as Genesis 1. Nevertheless, we can determine the sequence in which God created and organized. Event 1. Man Created Then the Lord God formed the man with dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Genesis 2, 7 Event 2. God Plants a Garden And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and he set the man there whom he had formed. Genesis 2, 8 
Event 3. God Causes Vegetation to Grow And the Lord God caused every tree that is pleasing to the eye and good for food to sprout from the ground, along with the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 2, 9 Event 4. God Puts Man in the Garden to Work and the Lord God took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to work and to tend it. Genesis 2, 15 Event 5 God creates the animals And the Lord God formed from the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the heavens. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And everything that the man named each living animal, that was its name. Genesis 2, 19 Event 6. God Creates Woman And the Lord God made a woman from the rib which he took from the man, and he brought her to the man. Genesis 2, 22. When you view both sets of creative and organizing events, you quickly see that they appear rather contradictory with respect to their order. If we set them side by side, we can compare the order. While we will not point out every discrepancy between these two accounts in their canonical forms, let's highlight a few. For example, when was man created? In Genesis 1, 26-27, God creates humanity on the sixth day, the end of the creation period. Furthermore, he creates man and woman at the same time. And God created humanity in his image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. But what do we see in Genesis 2? Man is God's first creation in Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord God formed the man with dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. In contrast, Woman is his final creation after the garden, vegetation, and animals. And where was humanity supposed to live? In Genesis 1, 28-29, we see God's command. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over every fish of the sea, and over every bird of the heavens and over every living thing that creeps upon the ground. And God said, Look, I have given you every plant-bearing seed that is upon the surface of the earth, and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit in it is yours for food. So God commands humanity to fill the earth and to rule over all the animals that were created. In contrast, we read in Genesis 2, 15-17, And the Lord God took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to tend and guard it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From every tree of the garden you may certainly eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you must not eat. We see that the man, and later the woman, do remain in the garden until they are driven out as a result of their disobedience. Genesis 3.23 It seems as though the story in Genesis 1 commands them to go into all the world while they are expected to remain in the garden in Genesis 2. With regards to animals and birds, in Genesis 1 we see that birds were created before the land animals, which were created before mankind. In Genesis 1.20 we read, And God said, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly over the earth, over the surface of the vault of the heavens. We then see, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their species, beasts and creeping things, and animals of the earth after their species. And it was so. And God made the animals of the earth according to their species, and the beasts according to their species, 
and every creeping thing of the ground according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1, 24-25 This all took place on day 6, before humanity had been created. However, in Genesis 2.19, we read, And the Lord God formed from the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And everything that the man called each living creature, that was its name. Clearly, in Genesis 1, the birds and land animals are created before mankind, while in Genesis 2, they are created specifically to try and fill a specific role for the man. Again, there are many other problems that can be discussed between these two accounts, but these will suffice. It is interesting to see how some other scholars have attempted to reconcile these contradictory accounts. For example, Victor Hamilton argues that the creation of animals in Genesis 2 is not the first creation of animals, but the creation of a specific group for Adam to name that occurs after the creation of animals in Genesis 1, 24-25. Of course, this seems to fly in the face of the natural reading of the verse. And the Lord God formed from the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the heavens, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And everything that the man named each living animal, that was its name. Genesis 2, 19. In short, there appear to be contradictions between the account of creation given in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4, A, and what we see in Genesis 2, 4, B through 25. We have focused on the contradictions and inconsistencies in the sequence of events that are given in the creation accounts. Although this is but the tip of the iceberg, however, our goal here is only to provide a specific contradiction that can be supported well by the data. The story of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and the snake has had a wide-reaching influence on Western culture throughout the last two millennia. But where does this story come from? Is the Eden narrative simply lifted from an ancient Mesopotamian myth? A completely independent work? Or perhaps something in between? In this section, we will provide a brief glimpse into some of the more common parts of the story that can be connected to earlier ancient Near Eastern myths and traditions to see how the story of Adam and Eve relates to earlier texts. While there are a number of aspects in the story that we could investigate at great length, I will try to focus on those portions that find greater overall agreement among scholars in the field concerning their intertextual relationships with older mythology. We will begin with the creation of man, particularly with respect to how he was created, his initial state, and his initial purpose in the garden. We will turn then to Eve, considering the order and method of her creation. Finally, our attention will turn to the theme of the lost chance at immortality that can be seen in the tree of life. I need to make something clear from the outset. The Garden of Eden story does not appear to recreate any one mythological text from the ancient Near East. In other words, there does not appear to be another Adam and Eve story, where a Mesopotamian man and woman are created by the gods and they live in and are expelled from a garden because of disobedience to the gods or the like. We can contrast this to the story of the flood in Genesis 6 through 9, which finds another clear parallel in the story of Atrahasis and Tablet 11 of the Epic of Gilgamesh. What appears in Genesis 2 through 3 is most likely a newly formed myth not directly patterned on a previous story. However, that does not mean that it does not also draw on common themes and motifs and perhaps even particular myths from the ancient Near East. Notice what 
car rights. Though Genesis 2-3 does not represent a reformulation of any one of these texts, it features a similar combination of anthropogonic and mortality themes as that was seen in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Moreover, the Mesopotamian cosmogonic tradition drawn upon in Gilgamesh seems to be part of a broader literary world in light of which certain features of Genesis 2-3 have particular significance, including the formation of the first human from clay, earth, his destiny to work the ground, the focus on divine wisdom, human sexuality and the lost chance at immortality for humans, the human distinction from animals by virtue of wearing clothing, and human multiplication. I will argue that the author of Genesis 2-3 borrowed directly or indirectly from earlier ancient Near Eastern mythologies, as evidenced by the close similarities and the textual and or cultural availability of these themes and motifs to the writer. A final opening word before we look at the specifics. As we argued in the previous section, both Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 through 3 appear to open their creation accounts by describing the state of affairs before the creative process began. Genesis 2, 4b through 7 reads, When Yahweh God made the earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field existed in the earth, and before any herb of the field had sprouted, because Yahweh God had not sent rain upon the earth, nor was there a man to work the ground, but a stream went up from the earth and watered the entire face of the ground, Yahweh God formed the man out of the soil of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Genesis 2, 4b-7 this type of pre-creation introduction is incredibly common in Mesopotamian literature, both in Sumerian and Akkadian texts. For example, in the Sumerian composition, Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and the Netherworld, In those days, in those distant days, in those nights, in those remote nights, in those years, in those distant years, in days of yore, when the necessary things have been brought into manifest existence, in days of yore, when the necessary things have been for the first time properly cared for, when bread had been tasted for the first time in the shrines of the land, when the ovens of the land had been made to work, when the heavens had been separated from the earth, when the earth had been delimited from the heavens, when the fame of mankind had been established, when An had taken the heavens for himself, when Enlil had taken earth for himself, when the netherworld had been given to Ereshkigal as a gift. Another example of this can be seen in a bilingual Sumerian Akkadian incantation from the mid first millennium BCE. The text opens A pure house, a house of the gods, had not yet been built in a pure place. A reed had not yet come out, a tree had not yet been created, a brick not yet laid, a brick not yet made, a house not built, a city not built, a city not built, animals not existing, Nippur not yet built, the Acor not built, Uruk not built, the Ayana not yet built, the Apsu not built, Eridu not built, the pure house, the house of the gods, their residence had not yet been built. All the countries were still a sea. As you can see, these texts, and many others, contain creation themes in which the pre-existing state of reality is described, setting the stage for the creative act. This can be seen in Genesis 2 through 3. Following a similar description of the state of the preformed world, Yahweh creates the man from the soil of the ground, animating him with divine breath. This process, 
of forming humans from earthen materials is well known from Mesopotamian sources. For example, in the story of Inki and Ninma, the story opens in the now all too familiar way. In those days, in the days when heaven and earth were created, in those nights, in the nights when heaven and earth were created. A few lines later, we see that the burden of providing for the senior gods is laid on the lesser deities. The senior gods oversaw the work, while the minor gods were bearing the toil. The gods were digging the canals and piling up the silt in Harali. The gods, crushing the clay, began complaining about this life. Inki is then encouraged to create beings that can shoulder the work for the minor deities. Inki says to his mother, My mother, the creature you planned will really come into existence. Impose on him the work of carrying baskets. You should knead clay from the top of the Abzu. The birth goddesses will nip off the clay, and you shall bring the form into existence. Another Sumerian text that speaks of both heaven and earth, and the creation of mankind from the earth, is the song of the hoe, the farming instrument, to be clear. The text begins, Enlil, who will make the human seed of the land come forth from the earth. And not only did he hasten to separate heaven from earth, and hasten to separate earth from heaven, but in order to make it possible for humans to grow in where flesh came forth, he first suspended the axis of the world at Doranki. Concerning these lines, Gertrude Farber writes, It begins with the separation of sky from earth. After a loving description of the magnificent Ho of the god Enlil, the creation of man is described, by which the Ho strokes clay into a human-like form and then digs up the earth from which men sprout like plants. This is quite similar to the more popular Akkadian story of Atrahasis, which opens in this way. When gods were man, they did forced labor, they bore drudgery. The lesser gods eventually took up arms and rebelled against their divine overlords and Inki is again commissioned to create a human to bear the burden of manual labor. The text reads as follows. Enki made ready to speak and said to the great gods, On the first, seventh, and fifteenth days of the month, I will establish a purification, a bath. Let one god be slaughtered, then let the gods be purified in it. Let Nintu mix clay with his flesh and blood. Let that same god and man be thoroughly mixed in the clay. Let us hear the drumbeat for the rest of time. From the flesh of the god, let a spirit remain. Both the theme of the creation of mankind from some earthen substance and his purpose to serve the gods are present at least two of these texts. In Atrahasis, a divine substance is introduced into the clay in order to bring about the final human form, as we see in Genesis 2-3. through Notice, however, that the burdensome aspect of the work the human is to perform is not present in the Eden narrative. Yahweh creates the man and places him in the garden to care for and protect it, Genesis 2-15. But this work is not cast in a negative light. Conversely, in both Inki and Ninma and Atrahasis, the gods are being relieved of their incredibly burdensome duties as this work is foisted upon the shoulders of newly formed humanity. As Dr. John J. Collins notes, In the Atrahasis story, humanity was created to do agricultural work for the gods. In Genesis, the first human being is also charged with keeping the garden of God, but the task does not appear to be onerous. 
This may suggest a type of inversion of the Mesopotamian tradition on the part of the writer of Genesis 2-3. One of the aspects of the Eden narrative that scholars focus on is the similarities between life before Eve and the purpose and method of her creation and themes and myths from the ancient Near East. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Enkidu, the companion of Gilgamesh, was created and lived in the wild among the animals. However, Shamha, a prostitute, from the city of Uruk, came and copulated with Enkidu, which resulted in him losing his kinship with the animals and becoming a civilized human. He is clothed, eats bread, drinks beer, and goes to live in the city of Uruk. As you recall from earlier in this video series, this progression from innocence to becoming civilized is a positive movement. People who live in the mountains, eat raw meat, and do not know what it is like to dwell in cities are backward and displeasing to the gods in general Mesopotamian thought. A good example of this can be seen in the Sumerian debate poem, The Debate Between Sheep and Grain. The opening of the composition, surprise, surprise, contains a dependent clause and speaks of conditions prior to the creative act. When upon the hill of heaven and earth, on spawned the Anuna gods. The story continues. The people of those days did not know about eating bread. They did not know about wearing clothes. They went about with naked limbs in the land. Like sheep, they ate grass with their mouths and drank water from the ditches. When we view the Eden narrative, we see a similar movement, ultimately from innocence to civilized. Adam is created and initially interacts with the animal kingdom, specifically to find a partner that is good fit for him. However, finding no such match Yahweh resorts to creating his partner from one of the man's own ribs. Eventually, following their disobedience in the garden, they are clothed, gain wisdom and understanding, and are brought out of their state of innocence and into a type of maturity. The difference, however, is that this movement is not positive. It is only through disobedience that they become civilized. The text paints this progression towards civilization in a negative light. Although the man is not to be associated with the animal kingdom, he retains his status as innocent and childlike, which appears to be a perhaps subtle inversion of Mesopotamian thought. The method of Eve's creation is another potential point of contact between the biblical text and the ancient Near Eastern mythology. The word used to describe how Yahweh created with the rib, the text reads, And Yahweh God created a woman with the rib he had taken from the man, and he brought her to the man. The word translated created in this verse is the Hebrew verb bana, which usually means to build. Normally the verbs for creating used in Genesis 1 and 2 through 3 are yatsar, to form, asa, to make, or bara, to create. Is the use of bana, to build, of any significance here? The verb banu in Akkadian, the cognate of banach in Hebrew, is used in context of creation. For example, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, when the gods decide to create a companion for Gilgamesh, we see the following scene. They summoned Aruru, the Great One. You, Aruru, created, literally built, the human race. Now create what Anu commanded to his, Gilgamesh's, stormy heart. Let that one be equal. Let them contend with each other. 
that Uruk may have peace. When Aruru heard this, she conceived within her what Anu commanded. Aruru wet her hands, she pinched off clay, she cast it down upon the step, she created, built, valiant Enkidu in the step. We see something quite similar in Enuma Elish. When Marduk heard the god's speech, he conceived a desire to accomplish clever things. He opened his mouth, addressing Ea. He counsels that which he had pondered in his heart. I will bring together blood and form bone. I will bring into being Lulu, whose name shall be Man. I will create, build, Lulu Man, on whom the toil of the gods will be laid, that they may rest. Even Atrahasis contains this verb in a similar context. Let the mother goddess create, build, a human being. Let man assume the drudgery of God. It would seem that this use of to build in the context of Mesopotamian creation accounts is rather common, but carries a somewhat nuanced meaning. Conversely, it is anything but common in the Hebrew Bible. Even evangelical professor Gordon Winham observes, Only here and in Amos 9.6 is this verb used of God's creative activity. Though in Akkadian and Ugaritic, it is the regular term for creation. Thus, the combination of the common use of the verb to build in other ancient Near Eastern creation stories coupled with its rare usage in the Old Testament, suggests that this is an echo of the Mesopotamian tradition. As you can see, although there are no known mythological traditions to which the Garden of Eden story directly corresponds, there are many connections that can be seen between the Eden narrative and ancient Near Eastern mythologies. Let's look at one last connection in the story of the garden. There is another point of connection between the Mesopotamian traditions and the Eden narrative, the theme of loss at the chance of immortality. As in the previous sections, we will not be able to cover all known occurrences of this theme in ancient Near Eastern literature, but there are some well-known myths that are often compared to the biblical story. The two stories that show up most frequently are the Epic of Gilgamesh, along with the less well-known Adapa and the South Wind. In each story, the protagonist is within arm's reach of a form of immortality only to lose it, either through deception or theft. Beginning with the Epic of Gilgamesh in Tablet 11, Gilgamesh finally makes his way to Utnapishtim, the survivor of the worldwide flood. As Utnapishtim has become immortal, Gilgamesh hopes to learn the secret to eternal life. Utnapishtim then recounts in full his dramatic story of the flood and how the gods granted him and his wife eternal life but place them far away, separated from humanity. At the mouth of the rivers. Then comes the kicker, at least for Gilgamesh. Now then, who will convene the gods for your sake, that you may find eternal life you seek? A perfect storm of events, forgive the pun, had led to Itnipishtim being granted eternal life. How would Gilgamesh convene the gods to have them agree to do the same for him? He couldn't. However, as a type of consolation prize, Utnapishtim agrees to tell him about a secret plant that grows under the water, which will rejuvenate the one that consumes it. Hooray! Off goes Gilgamesh, tying rocks to his feet that drag him down under the water, where he finds the plant now you might expect to see him consuming the plant the moment his head clears the water. But no. Gilgamesh said to him, to Ur Shinabi, the boatman. Ur Shinabi, this plant is a cure for heartache. 
whereby a man can regain his vitality. I will take it to ramparted Uruk. I will have an old man eat some, and so test the plant. You can probably guess what happens on his journey back to his home city, Uruk. At twenty double leagues they took a bite to eat. At thirty double leagues they made their camp. Gilgamesh saw a pond whose water was cool. He went down into it to bathe in the water. A snake caught the scent of the plant. Stealthily it came up and carried the plant away. On its way back, it shed its skin. Oh my. In short, Gilgamesh literally has in his hand the plant that would give him youth, as evidenced by the snake shedding its skin, but loses it. In this case, to a snake. This screams Garden of Eden loud and clear. The Mesopotamian story known as the Adapa and the South Wind also contains a story in which the main character has a shot at immortality but misses the opportunity. The myth has both Sumerian and Akkadian versions. Its composition goes back at least to the early 2nd millennium BCE, but was copied well into the 1st millennium BCE. The story tells of Adapa, a wise man who serves the god of Ea, who has bestowed upon him this wisdom. Adapa takes it upon himself to prepare the offerings for Ea each day, which includes fish. While on the water one day fishing for these offerings, the south wind blows hard and capsizes Adapa's boat. After struggling in the water all that day, Adapa angrily curses the south wind, because Ea has granted Adapa magical powers. The wing of the south wind is broken, and the wind does not blow for seven days. This eventually comes to the attention of Anu in heaven, who learns of Adapa's actions and summons him to heaven. Ea advises Adapa to be wary of what Anu might do. When you come before Anu, if they proffer you food of death, do not eat. If they proffer you water of death, do not drink. If they proffer you a garment, put it on. If they proffer you oil, anoint yourself. Ea warns that if Anu gives him food and drink, it will be the food and drink of death. As it turns out, this is not true. The food and drink would have bestowed upon Adapa eternal life. Notice Anu's words. Why did Ea disclose to a human being something bad of heaven and earth, the ability to do this kind of magic, and give him such a stout heart? Since he, Ea, has so treated him, Adapa, what for our part shall we do for him? Bring him food of life, let him eat. They brought him food of life. He did not eat. They brought him water of life. He did not drink. Anu stared and burst out laughing at him. Come now, Adapa. Why did you not eat and drink? Won't you live? Alas for the wretched peoples. Leaving aside why Ea might have tricked Adapa into passing up the chance at immortality, the salient point for our purposes is that Adapa had a shot at eternal life but was tricked into passing it up. If you're interested in a critical examination on why Inki, Ea, and Yahweh would lie to Adapa in the Mesopotamian story and Adam in the biblical one, the description will have the video just for you. With these stories in our minds, let's turn back to the Eden narrative. Yahweh commands the man and the woman not to partake of the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When they eat, they gain a certain level of knowledge and understanding, becoming more civilized, and this leads to a new circumstance for Yahweh to deal with. And Yahweh God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. 
And now, lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever, so Yahweh God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And he drove out the man, and he stationed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword that rotates to guard the path of the tree of life. Genesis 3, 22-24 Another missed opportunity. Here, the man and the woman have gained wisdom and understanding, but this has resulted in them being cut off from the tree of life, which had been within reach, if only for a brief period of time. What we see in the tree of life is likely quite similar in function to the plant that Gilgamesh found in the sea. It rejuvenated the individual to their youth by cutting off access to the tree. Yahweh was ensuring that they would not be able to partake of the tree of youth and would not be able to extend their lives through rejuvenation. Professor Joseph Blinkensop writes, Analogy between this plant of Gilgamesh and the tree of life, the fruit of which grants immunity from death, suggests that the proto-parents had not eaten its fruit because, being still young, they did not yet need rejuvenation. When taken together, the theme of the loss at the chance of immortality is clear in each of these stories. Given the presence of other points of comparison between these earlier myths and the story of Adam and Eve, the fact that there was a snake that was instrumental in the loss of access to the life-giving plant in the Epic of Gilgamesh, as well as in the Eden narrative, the biblical story here is quite likely dependent on the Mesopotamian traditions. Again, I owe a huge thanks to Dr. Joshua Bowen, who is an expert in Assyriology and Hebrew Bible studies, for his invaluable insights into the intricate details you watched in this video. The man is a linguistic genius, again, fluent in Sumerian, Akkadian, Aramaic, Hebrew. He has a book on how to read Sumerian and more and he's up to date with the latest scholarship in the field. His book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, is an absolute goldmine of information on this subject and much more. If you're serious about diving deeper, you can find it on Audible or grab a hardback copy. The link is also in the description. We trust you found the examination of how the biblical author skillfully repurposed earlier mythologies to craft their own unique narratives of creation and the great flood to be a fascinating endeavor. Has this revelation piqued your curiosity about delving further into the earlier Mesopotamian stories that influenced these biblical authors? We could probably do a series just discussing the ancient Mesopotamian myths and their stories for everyone to learn, because I am an honest believer that if you do not know those stories that way predate the Bible, you really don't get the background and the tradition that eventually birthed what we see and call the Bible. We eagerly wait your comments, sharing your favorite aspects of this video. Tell me what you liked the most. And if you appreciate our efforts in shedding light on these ancient connections, we kindly invite you to show your support by liking this video. Together, let's embark on a journey of exploration and research, akin to the creation of a whole new world of knowledge inspired by the ancient myths, much like the transformative act of creating from the carcass of Tiamat. Stay tuned for our next captivating installment in this enthralling series of Biblical Origins documentaries as we continue to unravel the mysteries and uncover the hidden truths woven within these ancient narratives. And never forget, we are MythVision.